Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation of Were We Invited? In other words, have humans been invited to an area in North America for the last many thousands of years? I'm Andrew Oyen, and this is my wife, Julie. Hello, everyone. And our presentation will review our 30-year study of odd human behavior and reported UFO and alien sightings and crashes in this one location. There is a corridor of land. 800 miles long by 200 miles wide in North America between Colorado and Texas that has been claimed and taken by force by nine Indian tribes and the countries of Spain, Mexico, France, and finally the United States in the year 1849. In the last 200 years, the U.S. has installed 17 army forts, a military institute, seven air force bases, including the first to carry the atomic bomb, the White Sands Missile Test Range, the Air Force Academy, the underground NORAD facility in Cheyenne Mountain, underground ICBM missile silos, and detonated the first atomic bomb at the Trinity site. In the last 100 years, the U.S. Department of the Interior has claimed land there for five national parks and four national forests. In the last 75 years, witnesses have reported various UFO and alien sightings, crashes, and retrievals, including the 1947 Roswell incident. In the last 55 years, witnesses have reported various cattle mutilations. So is this corridor of land now with some 264 towns and cities, a place where humans and aliens work together in underground bases, or a place where humans confront aliens with our newest weapons technologies. And now the real questions beneath all of this. Who invited humans to this corridor and why? Could it be visiting aliens? If so, is it to study humans and for what purpose? Could it be to study how we would interact with them? or how we would interact with each other in a close space or both. How much does the United States government know today and will they ever reveal it to us and the world? Only time will tell. Before we start, we would like to tell you a little bit about us. Hello, my name is Julia Oyen and I was born and raised and still living in Southern California. I found myself in the world of engineering, rocket ship to the moon type of stuff after getting an education in computer sciences. I was in software sales for 20 years and currently I run a, I run a business with my brother in communications. I'm more of a spiritualist, so finding my husband whose eyes were towards the sky only made sense. We've been married for 25 years, just about as long as this journey has been in writing these books. We have a 23-year-old daughter, Lauren, that we are proud to have as our book illustrator. Lauren is currently in art school getting her degree in game art. I've always had a fascination of the probability of life on other planets as it's too big a space for us to be alone. I too was born and raised in Southern California. I've had an interest in alien sci-fi movies from the time I could watch them in the 60s. As a child and young teen, I had a high interest in reading the investigative stories of the Hardy Boys and Sherlock Holmes. I was a Boy Scout, I am a military veteran, and I've worked as a mechanical designer and drafter for 25 plus years. My research and writing on ufology began after our visit to New Mexico and Roswell in 96. We published our first book, Southwest UFO Triangle Theory in 2013. Then our second book, Alien Park Dunes in 2018, which continued the theory study. So with that said, let's start our presentation. All right, here we go. Have humans been invited to an area in North America for the last many thousands of years? So first we show early humans coming over from Asia, then Spanish explorers coming up from the South, and then French explorers from the Northeast, and finally American explorers from the East. Imagine that you've just traveled to our planet Earth for the first time with the long-term goal of studying life forms here. Would you set up your base? Would you have more than one? 
Would it be on land or water? Would it be out in the open or hidden? Would you choose to be seen and involved or just from a distance? Our visiting alien base theory locates three underground bases in mountains shown here in North America that were created thousands of years ago. This concept is just a theory as we have no proof of visiting aliens. As you look through the following slides, it is very interesting what our human history will show us in the same area of this three base theory. We're looking at a colored 3D topo map that was made from a regular topo map with the help of IntraSearch Inc. and mapmart.com of Colorado. There are three others like it in this presentation. This one shows Blanca Peak in Colorado. This mountain has a crater as seen where we think UFOs may fly into a hidden base there. This is at the north end of our triangle. Guadalupe Peak, Texas is the second point on our triangle with a possible alien underground base. Casa Grande Peak, Texas is the third point on our triangle with a possible alien base. Blanca Peak in Colorado and Guadalupe and Casa Grande Peaks in Texas make up the triangle. This triangle was formed during the research conducted in our first book. The vertical leg from Blanca to Guadalupe Peak is related to the north to south flight path of the doomed UFO in 1947. The next two legs were connected with the Marfa Lights and the town of Roswell where UFOs had been seen. More on all of this in the following slides. More photos of these can be seen at our website at ufotriangle.com. The corridor 800 miles long by 200 miles wide is seen here for our studies of the new theory. We created a corridor around the triangle. We could have made it larger, but this size will work. The Marfa Mystery Lights, located just south of Marfa, Texas, is an area that experiences nighttime mystery lights. A visitor center was created a few miles east of Marfa on the highway where visitors can watch the nighttime show. These lights have been recorded for the last 138 years. Before that, nobody knows how long they have been appearing there. Humans have used fire and light for communications for thousands of years. Could this be a form of communication between alien bases? This shows the location of North American Indian tribes before the time of European exploration. It is interesting how their locations surround the triangle. What was the driving factor for this? What was the reason to move them all later onto reservations? This next statement is what we will see happen in this corridor. It is human to explore. It is political to claim land and fight to have and keep it. We humans do both. This shows the paths taken by three Spanish explorers in North America from 1528 to 1605. It is interesting on how they were drawn to the triangle. Here we see the 1713 North American land claims by Spain and France. This is the 1739 path taken by two French explorer brothers in North America. Again, it is interesting on how they were drawn to the triangle. Here we have the paths taken by two American explorers in North America from 1806 to 1820. Have you heard of Pikes Peak in Colorado? Well, NORAD, the underground base in Cheyenne Mountain, is only five miles away from that. This map is the same for both land claims happening within 25 years time. The Battle of the Alamo was in 1836 and this Texas land claim was nine years later. And now we see the US land claim of 1849. Here are the locations of 17 army forts between Colorado and Texas and a military institute in Roswell, New Mexico. 
Why so many forts in this location? Also, some of them are historical sites that you can now visit. This is the first territory map of Texas and New Mexico together. Another map with Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. This is the Goodnight Loving Cattle Trail of 1866. Instead of, Instead of taking a direct path north, it looks like they followed the Pecos River that flows next to Roswell. And of course, cattle need water. I wonder how many cattle were lost while they were near the triangle. You know, aliens have to eat too. This shows the relocation of the Native American Indian tribes from the Triangle and onto reservations in the 1800s. They may have the strongest relations with these visiting star people. What we call aliens, they call star people. More on this later. This is the final map formation for these three states. Our government obtained the land at these three locations, making them national parks, giving them federal protection, and insisted that you pay to visit. If it is true that this effort was to hide alien bases, then you are paying for the aliens to study you while there. Again, there is more info on this at our website at ufotriangle.com. More land taken and placed under federal protection. Other places of interest on the triangle like Taos Ski Valley and Carlsbad Caverns. Here are some of the 264 towns and cities on the triangle and in the corridor. Here are locations of Colorado and New Mexico Air Force bases and the Air Force Academy. Note that all of these bases were developed after we entered into World War II in 1941. Why was it so important to have our atomic bomb air wing on the triangle at Roswell? Were we trying to impress anyone in that area? Here we show the location of the Trinity bomb site of 1945. Why didn't the US government choose a location out in open desert, like in California, Nevada, maybe even Utah? That would have been hundreds of miles away from any town. Why did they chance exposing US citizens to radiation and death? What was so important that they must explode the device here? Did the US government need to demonstrate a new weapon to watching eyes on a distant mountaintop? This slide shows where the bomb was created at Los Alamos and then detonated near surrounding towns. It was reported that ash fell on the closest towns. Here we see the Roswell incident of July 1947. There was one reported debris site. This was a location with pieces of what they think was the UFO. But there was more than one reported crash site where the UFO was and the bodies. The book on the left was given to me by my brother Greg. And that began my interest that UFOs could be visiting Earth. The book on the right has a crude map in it of the event. From these details of these two books, I drew my own maps locating Corona, Roswell, and the debris and crash sites. Later, I found that it was not that accurate as I did more research. Here is my close up detail drawing of the event. The debris site again had pieces of the UFO and the crash site had the UFO and bodies. 
How do you like my aliens? <laughs> They're so lifelike. This is a 3D wall map that we found at a museum in New Mexico. We will use this map again throughout this uh, lecture presentation. We found later all the really neat stuff that's on it, including the Trinity site, White Sands Missile Test Range. We've got uh, Roswell, the air, where the Air Force Base was. We've got Guadalupe Peak, Texas, which happens to be the tallest elevation in Texas. And we've got the area of um, the 1947 UFO event. Just wanted to show here my interest in the subject and past ties to MUFON and the UFO Museum in Roswell. I started out reading newspapers and any interesting uh, tidbit having to do possibly with US, uh, UFOs, I would clip it and mail it in. This is our collection of the Jim Ragsdale story on books and video. These had details and maps that invited us to New Mexico. These items were sold for a number of years by the Roswell UFO Museum. We've been given permission to show you items from this book and we have marked up some of these items to help show details. What's important about the Jim Ragsdale story? Well, in July, 1947, Jim and his girlfriend were camping out near Boy Scout Mountain, about 60 miles to the west of Roswell. And reportedly they saw an explosion happen to the north of them in the night sky. Then moments later, they witnessed something crash land near them. In their story, they go with a flashlight to investigate. They find an object they can't describe as a regular aircraft. It's got torn holes in it. And looking inside, they saw what appeared to be very strange bodies. Here's a few, a few photos from the book of Main Street from that time. Wait, where's the Starbucks? This is the Roswell Army Airfield of the time later known as Walker Air Force Base. This base was the first to have the bomb in the US, meaning their B-29 aircraft could carry and deliver it. Here we have the July 1947 Roswell stories of finding and then not finding a flying saucer. The same military who has the bomb verifies, yes, we have a flying saucer. And then, no, we do not. This cover-up begins all within a few days of each other. Here is one of the detailed maps in the book. And it has a nice legend on the side and we pointed out the items in the legend. Uh, we've got Roswell, we've got the crash site, We've got the debris site. We have the other reported crash site north of Roswell. It is about 60 miles from Roswell to the impact site on Capitan Mountain, Boy Scout Mountain. Also includes a, a good uh, dirt road that's kind of rough. So you may not want to visit this place at night. This looks to be a photo taken from a balloon ride to Roswell, New Mexico. Looking west, you can see Roswell and the Capitan Mountains. The crash site is on the lower right hand side of the mountains. This photo is at the debris site looking south at the Capitan Mountains. The crash site is on the lower left hand side of the mountain. Roswell is to the far left. Here's another detailed map and photo from the book. You can see the uh, two lane highway from Roswell and then uh, the exit to Boy Scout Mountain, which is a dirt road on up to the impact site, which is next to Boy Scout Mountain. 
Here's another detailed map of the same thing. These are two photos near the impact site. One is of an old mine. The other is a camping area, possibly the area that Jim Ragsdale was at. The top photo looks north to the debris site out in the desert. The bottom looks south. This photo looks at the impact site where the UFO hit rocks and had stopped. Other photos of the impact site. Another photo of the impact site where they note old and new trees. So if an alien UFO crashed here, was there a fuel leak? What type of fuel did they use? If it leaked, did it damage the environment? Here are photos of cut pathways near the impact site. If trees were plowed down in the crash, were they also cut down to remove the object? Now these photos, as you can see, were 49 years after the event. This is the history of uh, helicopters and heavy lift helicopters. If something crashed into a forest hillside in 1947 near Roswell and heavy lift helicopters were not in use until 1948, then the military must have dragged it out to the dirt road and loaded it onto a truck or trailer. This must have required cutting down some trees to make a pathway to do so. So um, if anyone is still around who worked at the Walker Air Force Base back in 1947, it'd be interesting to know if there were any helicopters located for use on that base. The next few slides show our 2019 research with a company in Roswell, New Mexico, Airplay Media and Adventure Services. They conducted a ground and drone survey of the impact site resulting in many photos. We found these photos to be very different from the 1996 photos in the Ragsdale book. This was mostly, most likely from having fires in the area after 1996. These photos show many trees that have been cut down in the impact site area. Do you see the many sticks in this photo? They are down trees. We see the same with this photo. Did fires bring down all these trees? This rock formation is very near the impact site. We are unsure if it is the same spot. This map shows our four day visit to New Mexico in May of 1996. We started and ended in Albuquerque going counterclockwise. We had a lot of fun and would do it again. Do you remember what started us on this trip? I asked if you wanted to go to New Mexico. Oh yeah, sure. Shopping, restaurants, and sightseeing. Well, I said maybe we could do some of that too. So what do you want to do? Well, that's when I showed you the book and said, here's a map where a UFO crash you want to go. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. We went. I know. Okay. <laughs> well, on this trip, we stayed the night in Las Cruces, and the next day we went out to visit this uh, museum at the uh, missile range. So this photo, not very clear, as it was taken as we drove down the highway to get to the White Sands Missile Range Museum. And we later noticed Guadalupe Peak in the background. You can barely see it there. So imagine if someone had optical equipment on the mountain peak. They could, over the years, have watched all the activities going on at this missile range. The museum has many static di displays on the items tested at this range. Here's one named Aeroshell or Flying Saucer. Uh, no, that's not an alien, that's my husband.
When we made it into Roswell, we visited the UFO museum there, this being the old museum. I saw and met with Max Littell, who I had contacted before by letter and by phone. He reviewed with me how to drive out to the impact site and then where to find a Mexican restaurant for dinner. So after a long day's drive, sightseeing and a nice meal, I was ready for the motel and bed, but that was not to be. No, I had another idea, especially having dinner and a couple margaritas. Let's go see the UFO crash site up on the mountain and in the dark. Well, it was another 120 mile round trip and we did not see the motel until 1 a.m., but it was an exciting adventure. We drove as far as we could and then hiked a little with a, a flashlight. We found the campsite and were surprised at how quiet it was. I mean, you couldn't hear anything, which was very eerie. On the drive back, we had to go really slow so as not to hit the many animals on the road. We had these jackrabbits that were like stunned by the lights from the car and they kept coming towards us. And um, even deer jumping over fences that were riding alongside the car. It was just a very bizarre thing. We saw these animals all over the place. The next morning after that traumatic evening, <laughs> we drove to the area of the debris site, not far from Corona, New Mexico. We stayed on the dirt road and took photos from left to right with the crash site some 32 miles away on the mountain, which was due south of us. It was May the 5th and a clear warm day with no clouds. I decided to take photos standing on top of the vehicle for a better view. When finished, I asked Julie to get a photo of me pointing at the mountain. We were using our 35 millimeter film camera where we ended up taking nine rolls of film on this trip. We saw the developed photos some 10 days later. Look what we got now. Of all the 300 plus photos taken on our trip to New Mexico, this one stood out as extremely strange. As I said, I was pointing to the crash site and my other hand represented the UFO. I was thinking about the UFO, it just exploded and now it's gonna, it's gonna fly another 32 miles and hit that mountain over there. This cloud showed up later when the film was developed. Seeing this photo officially launched my studies into UF research. What the heck was it? I don't know what it is. It kind of looks like a UFO. I don't know, or I, I have no idea, but it, it just shocked me. My thought process was this. Many have already reviewed that something crash landed near Roswell in 1947. My research will be this. What was it doing there? Where did it come from and where was it going? To date, our research indicates that the UFO was flying from point A to point B, experienced an explosion and then crashed. This photo and letter were on display in the UFO museum for many years. And I had to just throw my two cents in here because I was the one taking the picture. And I tell you, there was not a, a cloud in the sky. There was nothing. I mean, this was a beautiful, bright, clear, blue, sunny day. And to see, when I picked up the pictures, to see the development of the saucer-shaped cloud in the background was just a shocker. And I knew it would get Andy excited. I just didn't know if this would all come from it. <laughs> You were hoping this trip would just put uh, I, water on the fire of my UFO I, interest. I thought it was going to quell it. I thought you were going to be done. That's the whole reason why I thought, sure, let's go to New Mexico. Let's get it out of his system. But no, this picture happened. And here we are. Yeah. Okay. As a kid, I was not into comic books. These were the books I enjoyed reading. I recall riding the bus to the bookstore in the next town to buy the Hardy Boys book collection, one at a time, of course, as I read through them. I just wanted to state that I have some experience with getting a vessel from point A to B in a safe and at times stealthy manner. All of this work was hands-on with no automation. That said, I wonder if the UFO that crashed was fully automated. 
and the aliens on board were just passengers on a ride from one base to another. I think this, due to the straight path the UFO took from the debris site to the crash site. And crashing into an open desert would have been a better choice than a hillside. Maybe they had no choice in the matter. They were just terrified and riding out the crash. These books helped get me started in the UFO review. There are lots of books out there with good details and these certainly helped. This chart helps explain something important. I worked with Craig Fuller who shared his data on historic records of aircraft crashes. And this report for the years 1946 and 1947 show that there were no aircraft crashes in New Mexico next to Boy Scout Mountain. So if an aircraft didn't crash at Boy Scout Mountain and it wasn't recorded, then what crashed there next to Jim Ragsdale's campsite? Stated before that if something crashed on a hillside and we've got the Department of Agriculture responsible for that hillside, I figured, well, maybe they'd know something about it and make a report. Yeah, something crashed there, damaged all these trees, damaged the environment. And look at the military, they just tore it up some more to drag it out of there. I figured somewhere in the records of our government, they're There'd be some notation there that in the, July 1947, there'd be damage noted for this hillside. Well, I, I put in several FOIA requests in different ways. I, I got creative trying to state it in more than once in different ways. And their answer was always, there is no data. Well, what I never got them to state and they never did state, what was that they were 100% certain that records never existed or were removed. They never said that. They just said, no data found today. Neat books that I've collected along the way to help give me research on uh, UFO and aliens. Some of them were pretty scary at the time. Here's another topo map showing the debris and crash site. From this, we have the flight path from north to south. Again, we're looking at the wall map where I've uh, drawn on it this time, this photograph. And I didn't go to the museum and draw on their map. No, this is <laughs> drawn on a, on a picture. But we, we now can see some very interesting points on here. We see Corona. We see Roswell. Uh, we've got Guadalupe Peak down there. And I said Guadalupe Peak was the highest elevation of Texas. And between the debris site shown there and the crash site, that's my flight path from north to south. And continuing that flight path, it goes straight to Guadalupe Peak. Very interesting. We mentioned before the possibility of damaged hillside when the UFO crashed and it was retrieved. Well, the concept between myself and Max Littell was, hey, maybe we can find some photographs before and after the crash site to possibly see the forest damage. Well, a professional service was uh, hired and a 1946 photograph was found. We've circled the crash site. Now, um, you can, with the right equipment, you can zoom in and get better looks close up. So let's uh, go to the next one. This is that same photograph, but close up. And this is the uh, crash site or impact site near Boy Scout Mountain. Boy Scout Mountain would be over to the left. And this photograph, as you can see, we were working with the Earth Data Analysis Center. So now having this good photograph, which could still be zoomed in, 
which happened eight months before the UFO event. Now all we need is the next photograph, either later in 1947 or early 1950s to see a comparison where trees knocked down when it crashed and when it was dragged out. Well, the answer was no. The report was sent back and we highlighted some interesting things in here. So this professional company took a look and they searched the catalogs of the National Archives having negative results. So this note back stated, the photos most likely had been taken and they should have been in the catalog. And then they noted the military no-fly zone that they found. Here is uh, images of the catalog pages that they found. Circled, top left on both is the crash site. Top right on both is Roswell and center bottom on both is Guadalupe Peak. So why was there a military no-fly zone for photographs for this area? What was so important? What could they possibly have been hiding after 1946? Well, this got me going from not just research, but to try to explain myself, I wrote theories. And at the time, the UFO Museum in Roswell was accepting two-page theories, so they would publish them. And in one year, I, they published four of my theories. The first two of them were about Guadalupe Peak possibly being an alien base. This is a portion of the first theory, Eyes Over Roswell. And I list military installations and other items of possible alien interest that were 800 miles out from Guadalupe Peak, Texas. This is the other portion of that theory showing the Army and the Navy and Marine bases in those locations or close by. Here's the work of Chris O'Brien on the San Luis Valley and Blanca Peak in Colorado. So while I was reviewing strange things happening around Roswell and Guadalupe Peak and the crash sites, Chris was reviewing a strange valley and a mountain in Colorado with strange activity. I read his work and saw his lecture at MUFON, and I had a good feeling that our research was related. Today, Chris is involved in a project to capture live UFO activity on camera in the same San Luis Valley. You can learn more about this at the website ufodap.com. That's ufodap.com. Here again is Blanca Peak that Chris has written about. I got to say that recently on a radio show, I was asked, how certain am I that aliens are not at this location? My answer. I'm so certain that they're there, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I don't want to go to that crater, look around, and uh, meet them. Because why? Well, you never know what's going to happen. OK. These maps and my sketches show the flight path of the UFO from the Colorado Valley and Chris's books and his work to the debris site and crash sites in New Mexico and on down to Guadalupe Peak, Texas. Here's where the connection was made between our two works. We attended a MUFON lecture and dinner with the late great ufologist Stanton T. Friedman. His positive, re his positive review in the Jim Ragsdale story helped to encourage me on my research. It was really good to meet him. Smokey the Bear was found in 1950, just 20 miles from the 1947 UFO crash site. 
Forest fires happen every year and sadly animals are hurt or killed in all of them. In the US government could have chosen an animal representative to fight forest fires from any one of these fires and locations from around the US. Why was it so important to pick an injured animal from this location and time? Could this have been part of a cover-up for the crashed UFO? Think about this bear we have just found over here and not the UFO and alien bodies that we found over there. Poor Smokey, was he just used as a cover story? Poor bear. <laughs> here we have the locations of NORAD and ICBM sites in Colorado and New Mexico. These underground sites house missiles and controls for one part of our nuclear triad defense force. The other two parts include our Air Force bombers and Navy submarines. Why locate these important military facilities on and so close to the triangle? Again, are we trying to impress someone in the area? Here we show some of the locations of reported UFO sightings. As there are fewer towns closer to the border, it would be projected that not as many sightings occur down there. Here are three locations that you can visit today to celebrate alien UFO, UFOs and the strange lights in the sky. You have to catch up. I've been to all three of those places. <laughs> you haven't been to all three. No, I haven't. Okay, so this is my uh, this is my triangle map, my theory map from 1998. So I've shown everything that's on or very very close to the triangle. A lot of things were happening on there that uh, really brought my attention the whole to the whole thing, the whole story. Something's going on between Colorado and Texas. Star people, what Native Americans call aliens. Dr. Artie Sixkiller Clark has written four books on this subject. These interesting stories are of the past and the present. You can find them all on amazon.com. So were we invited or not? If yes, then by who? If the US government knows, will they ever tell us? What will happen in the next 29 years when we hit 2050? Looking forward to uh, seeing what the government has to say. Here is our 2013 book on our research, Southwest UFO Triangle Theory. And our 2018 book on our updated research with a fun science fiction story to go along with it. Both can be found at Amazon and other online locations. And we have plenty of information on both books, again, at our website. Thank you for your time and interest on this subject. And for more information, go to our uh, website, ufotriangle.com. And you can reach us at Facebook, Alien Park Dunes, and you're welcome to email us. Well, thank you very much.